Thank you, Joy Choir. Thank you, George Stoon. Appreciate it. If you have your Bibles, I'd love for you to open up to 1 John chapter 3. And many of you know we've been on this journey for the last several weeks. Let me ask you, I know it's been 168 hours, but how many of you remember you were given an assignment last week? Anybody remember that you were actually given us? I'm not asking what it is. I'm just asking how many of you remember that you were given an assignment last week? How many of you were here last week? Just raise your hand. Okay. There was an assignment, a challenge that says, I want you to talk about this message outside of the doors of the church. Anybody remember that now, vaguely? How many of you actually did that? Just raise your hand really quickly. Okay. All right. Well, I'm going to tell you in advance that you'll have a similar assignment at the end. And one of the reasons we do that is my prayer is that once the word of God lands inside of your heart here in these, in these walls, that actually it would become a part of your life, your daily conversation, your, among your daily interactions and your dialogues. And so just kind of keep that in mind as we're trying to put the word into action inside. Now, this is the year of sacred love. And sacred love has combined two words that are very unique words, um, both in and of themselves. They're, they're precious words, sacred and love. And as you remember, as we launched this back in February, the, the com- combination may seem a little bit strange. In fact, you could almost separate them a little bit easier because what does love have to do with holiness or being sacred or being set apart? And it would be easier just to kind of separate them. But what is amazing is that the, the, one of the theme verses that we are having, you memorize through the course of the year, is the two great commandments. The first one is, love the Lord your God with what? All your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. Okay, then it says, this is the first and great commandment. The second one is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. That verse is actually drawn from Leviticus, of all places, chapter 19, in verse 18. Leviticus 19, 18. Scholars have put Leviticus chapter 17 to Leviticus chapter 26, that, that set of chapters, and they have called it the holiness code, which is an interesting term, but if you read through those, those chapters, you'll see exactly why, because so many verses in, in the content actually deal and address with what does it mean to be holy, especially as the Levitical priest. But in that Leviticus 19, 18, obviously there's that verse, but earlier, Leviticus 19, 2, it says, he said, I am holy and you shall be holy. So God's word tells us to be holy because God is holy. Later on in the chapter, it says, love your neighbor as yourself. So God's word actually connects sacred and love in the same chapter. So what I'm gonna encourage you to do is, is that, that you understand that there's no such thing as love without sacred and there's no such thing as sacred without love a lot of times when we look at sacred and holy we think well we kind of have to be separate we have to be set apart and sometimes it can get almost an attitude of condemnation and judgment of those who are not so sacred and not so holy but God's word says there's no separation there's no gulf no chasm between God's love and God's holiness if you have God's holiness you have his love and if you have his love that's why you have his holiness I believe that's what's so confusing in the 21st century because when we think of loving people, we think we need to accept them with all their lifestyles and all their decisions and all their sins and and, and, and just encompass them regardless of what you believe doctrinally. Pastor, we need to accept everybody. Well, if we love them according to God's love, we have to love them with God's holiness as well. And so this is going to be the challenge. Last week, we closed up in 1 John chapter 3, verse 10, where we see that, G, that the writer is actually drawing a distinction between those who are divine and those who are diabolic. Verse 10, it says, by this, the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. So there has to be a line of distinction, a line of demarcation. And so in chapter 3, verses 11 through 18, we're going to be challenged of how to put the sacred love into action. And so we're going to encourage you over the next few moments to see a contrast that the Apostle John draws between the love of Christ and the hatred of Cain. Spiritual life or eternal life and spiritual death. 
the selfless sacrifice of Christ versus Cain's act of murder. So there's going to be a series of contrasts. So let's begin in chapter 3, verse 11. God's word tells us and calls us. He says, for this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. So we're going to start with that. And so what he's going to do is is this sacred love is going to stand in contrast to the hatred of Cain. Because verse 12 says, not as Cain, who was of the evil one and slew his brother. And for what reason did he slay his brother? Because his deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. So we're going to draw a contrast and comparison between Christ and the command to love and the hatred of Cain. Cain. And so let's pick up the command to love one another first. Very simple command. It's not negotiable. I love how he changes the word you to we. He says, this is a message you have heard from the beginning and you have received that we, so he doesn't exclude himself from this command. He said that we should love one another, that we ought to love one another. So this is what I would call the core command. And I think sometimes, how many of you find it easy to love when people are very nice and sweet? But that's not the context here. There's division in the church, there's false teaching in the church, there's doctrinal issues in the church. And sometimes I think when we're pushed and pressed, it's more difficult to love. And so he's calling us with this core command to, that, we, that we should love one another. Now, this command and this call to command has to be understood that it's been from the beginning. This has been the very core of Jesus' message. It's the core of who God is. As we saw in, uh, earlier, it says God is love. So we understand that process, that this is who he is. And if this is who he is, and this is who lives inside of us, and this is whom we follow, then we should love as well. So it's been from the beginning. It's not a new message at all. Now, what does the command mean? It's to love one another. This is the word agape, right? So God's love, notice this. So I'm, I want you to match this definition with your life and the way you love. So God's love, agape love, is obviously unconditional. So it doesn't matter how the person responds, doesn't matter how they act, how they look, it's no condition attached to that. It's such as, I love you if you're nice to me, or I love you if you're beautiful, or I love you if you give me money, or I love you if you do this, or I love you because, and then you list all those things as well. God's love is unconditional. But I wanna add one other thing. God's love to always takes the initiative. It doesn't wait to be loved. It moves first. It's the first to help. It's the first to speak a word of kindness. It's the first to, it doesn't wait for, uh, I can't tell you how many people say, Pastor, when they're nice to me, I'll be nice to them. When they speak kind words to me, I'll speak kind words to them. No, God's love always takes the initiative. And that love always looks for the needs of someone else, that their needs are greater and more important than your needs. This is where it gets challenging for us as believers, that we always, because I can't tell you how many people come to our church and they leave and this is a reason. Pastor, my needs are not being met. We're shopping for a church and we come in like a consumer and we're shopping and there's 600 churches in Singapore, so we want to know which church really meets our needs the best whether it's children or youth or whether it's music or worship or style or length of service or or the message or the preaching or the program or the personality or whatever it might be, location, and, 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 and whatever it might be. So we come in as a consumer, and yet we love like a consumer. We love like, this is what I can get out of this. But God's word says, agape always puts the other person's needs ahead of your own. And this is where it gets challenging. Then the next phrase often gets left alone. It says love, we got this, unconditional, always takes the initiative, always puts the other person's needs ahead of our own. But then it says a unique term. It says that we should love whom? What does it say? That we should love in verse 11. This is a message which we've heard from the beginning, that we should love whom? One another. Now, it's kind of different when you just go one direction. But love one another is a mutuality of love. It means it needs to go in both directions, which means there needs to be an openness and a free flow. This is where it gets challenging. Because a lot of times when you love someone, they don't love you back. Or when you love someone, they seem to keep a guard or a barrier up. But if we're going to love each other, it needs to be a mutuality, a, 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 a togetherness in this. So for instance, if I love you and you have your guards up and you have your walls up and I can't get to you, this command actually is not being done. 
If I keep my guards up and I don't let you in, then I'm not receiving your love and I can't give you back. And a lot of people put guards up, a wall of protection around them. Because sometimes we don't want to share our hurt. So let me give you an example. How many of you would want to know if, if I was hurting? Only eight of you? Okay. Talk to me after church. I'll get your name. But would you want to, do you love me that much? To, if I was really hurting, would you want to know? Okay, it's growing in momentum, but not much. <laughs> but if we really love someone, we would want to know what's inside of them if we're hurting. And I'm, God says in this church, if we're going to love one another, sometimes we might need to put our faces and our guards down and allow people to see our hearts. That love needs to flow freely. So many times we worry about what we look like and how we appear to each other instead of truly ministering and pouring love into the, to the deepest heart. We have so many people in our church that are hurting. But when we come to church, you would never know it. You give a projection, but how can we love you if we just love a face or we just love a, a facade or we love a front or we love in a projection that's actually not too accurate? That's not love. Love says, if you hurt, if you bleed, if, you, if, if you're hurting, I need, I need somebody to help me here. And if you're hurting, I, I need to help you. And so my, my encouragement to you is a simple command. is do not gloss it over and just say, you know, we'll be nice to each other and we'll be cordial to each other. But there should actually be an authenticity and a transparency in our love for one another. What a striking contrast, Sue. Because the love command, that's the core command. But then he says in contrast, there's this hatred from Cain. He says, not as Cain, who was of the evil one. And then he says, who slew his brother. And for what reason did he slay his brother? He slew him because his deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. So now we're, we're given two choices. So if you do not love like God loves you, with that, 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 that unconditional love where the other person's needs are more important than you are, that it's a free, free flow of loving one another. Guess what category we're following? Because John only gives us two choices. Either we love one another or we're like Cain. So you're, you're going, isn't there like door number three, door number four? Aren't there other options available? And, and God's word does not give you another option. Either you love one another, according to verse 11, or you're like Cain, who has hatred. So let's look at Cain's hatred. And obviously, Cain is obviously used quite a bit in the New Testament as an example of that Genesis 4 account. It's like when you mention Cain, how many of you remember the story? Anybody? Immediately. So it's kind of like throwing a name out without telling you the whole story. Like, don't be like Hitler. Don't be like Stalin. Don't be like Pol Pot. Don't be like Idi Amin. We can list a whole, and we don't have to give you the whole narrative. You know exactly what we're talking about, do you not? And so Cain was like in that category. So what is the source of Cain's hatred? It says, not like Cain, who was of the evil one. Obviously, that's the devil. That's Satan. That's the adversary. So God's word says this hatred, which is the opposite of love, is actually from the evil one actually from Satan himself. So if you're not in the activity and the motion of free flow love, unconditional, always put in the other person's needs, the transparency of loving each other, God says you must be of the evil one. And if you're of the evil one, then look what the expression of that is, who slew his brother. That word slew is a very vicious, violent word. It, it speaks of butchering. Literally, it could be even cutting the throat. In Mongolia, several years ago, we had the chance of going to watch them. Um, they have a lot of lambs and a lot of sheep. And so they said, would you like us, to, would you like to witness that? I don't know what got into me that day, but I went. And, but it was so peaceful the way they did it. But still, the, 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 the knife was put to the throat. That's the exact same word that's used here. In fact, it's the same word that's used in Revelation 5 that talks about the Lamb of God that was slain. In Revelation 6, it talks about the martyrs that were slain. Same word. So it's obviously a violent death. And this is what God's word says, that he slew his brother. Well, what was the reason of his slaying? What was the reason of this expression that the evil one had, had prompted in his heart? It says, because his deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. So there's a distinction, right? There was a comparison. There was a competition. And I know none of us here at IBC compare or compete. Amen? 
Okay, let's rephrase that. We, we have a tendency, humanly, to look at other people. And, and we, we begin to look and compare, and, and, and that's exactly what Cain did. Cain compared, and he looked, and he said, his, and what's so sad about this is, they were brothers. They had the same parents. They were blood relatives. They even went to the same worship service. And as they were going to the same worship service to worship the same God, something tragic happened. They both offered sacrifices or offerings. One was accepted and one was not. And thus the resentment. In fact, later on in Jude, it tells us, don't go by the way of Cain. Talks about his murderous nature, talks about his rebellion, talking about his defiant disobedience. Don't go that way. Because there was a shift that took place and a change that took place. And now there's a radical expression of that. Now, my prayer is to you is, as we're challenging you, as one stands in contrast to the other, sacred love or the hatred of Cain. Which one are you? And you're going to say, let's do it by process of elimination. I don't have the hatred of Cain, then I must have the love of God. No, I would actually do it the other way. If you do not have the love of God, you have the hatred of Cain. The love of God is loving one another unconditionally, always putting the other person's needs ahead of your own, always looking out and taking the initiative, always taking the first response, always moving, always, always looking how we can care for one another. Then we come to the second part, where sacred love not only stands in contrast to Cain's hatred, but sacred love gives us proof that we have received eternal life. So if you, are, if you have the hatred of Cain and, and in the hating of the, of the world, because Cain is in that category, it actually, you will receive death. But if you are a loving believer, according to God's word, you will receive eternal life. So let's look at verse 13. He says, do not be surprised, brethren, if the world hates you. So here he's telling us that if we're going to be followers of Jesus Christ, even when we love each other, the world in contrast is going to not only hate but hate you and he's going to target so we as christians we share faith yes we share a fellowship yes but we also share that we are a target of the enemy if your goal and your desire in life is to be popular and to be well received and you're a follower of christ you've chosen the wrong path because god's word says the world will hate you very clearly stated. Now what's sad is, is he says for the very first time, he says, do not be surprised, brethren. It's the only time that he uses the word brethren to address them. Now he uses the word brethren, says love your brothers and all that kind of stuff, but he doesn't address them as brethren, except here in all of 1 John. He usually calls them my little children or he calls them beloved. But for the first time, he calls them brethren. Do you know why? Look at the example that he's using. Cain and what? Abel. And what were they? What a striking contrast. Physically, they were brothers, but spiritually, they were not. God says we're family. God says we're brothers, that we are part of the same family. We share the same father. We share the same forgiveness. We share the same inheritance. We share the same future. We share the same heavenly home. And now he's calling us brothers. So there should be something remarkably different than the blood brothers between Abel and Cain. Then he jumps, let's jump to verse 15. It says, everyone who hates his brother is a what? Murderer. Whoa, that's a big accusation. And he says, for you know that no murderer, no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. So he's going to tell us that if you have a hating heart, that you actually will receive judgment and death. This is where it gets really critical that we understand where our hearts are aligned now, this word hate, obviously, um, is, is a word that we associate with viciousness, violence, um, we, we, with, with um, even um, a sense of, of expressive animosity, antagonism, and, and hostility. But I think, obviously, that is hate. No question about that. But I want you to understand you can hate in different ways. You can hate by indifference. If you've ever ignored somebody, if you ever overlooked somebody, I promise you, the person who feels ignored and overlooked feels hated. God's word is going to be very critical. And this is where I think we kind of gloss over in the 21st century Christianity, especially sometimes when we have 
attitudes of judgment and condemnation or criticism toward other groups or other people and we justify that and rationalize that because of their political views, their military views, their economic views, their national views, their doctrinal views, whatever it might be. But now we come in and says this, that if you do not love, you're hating. If you do not love the way Christ has, he's going to equate this. And even though the hate may not be expressed in hostility, the hate may be expressed in the heart. Now, Jesus confirms this in, in the Sermon on the Mount. Many of you know this. It says, it says the ancient text has said this very clearly. If whoever commits murder shall be liable to the court. Do not commit murder. But I say to you, this is where Christ brings it to a different heart level. He says, if whoever is angry, whoever hates his brother, shall be liable to the court. So what used to be in the external Old Testament law as a commandment, do not kill or do not murder, now God says if you hate or if you're angry with your brother, it's equivalent to murder. And so now God is looking more at the heart. And he's pulling us in and he's drawing us to do a self-examination. So let me put this question out to you. The question is not what did you do, but what did you want to do? How many times have you looked at someone and just like, <clears throat> and you want it, but you said, Pastor, I didn't say anything. But inside your heart, you said it. How many of you have ever looked and wanted a demise of someone else, of someone else to be rejected, of somebody else to, 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 to receive that, that wrath, and yet you may have kept it inside, but God who sees the heart and examines the heart knows exactly. So the question is not always, what did you do, which is important, but I think for us in 21st century, especially Christianity, when we tried to put a face and a facade, it's not so much what did you do as much what did you want to do? Did you have, any of you ever seen what we call a killer look? Killer eyes? Like, if, you, if, if, if that person look, could kill you with their eyes, we'd be doing your funeral tomorrow. Now, how many of you have noticed that? How many of you have ever received killer eyes? Okay, don't point at the person who gave that to you right now. But we all have. And so what has happened a lot of times is we keep, we, we, do we think that we're just out here. But God's word is very clear. That if you do not love, you're hating. It's incipient. That, that hatred, that, that animosity, even if we do it by indifference and not just hostility and violence. So God is looking at you and me, analyzing our heart. Which heart do you belong to? So this contrast, a hating world will receive death. But look in verse 14, in striking contrast, and this is my prayer for IBC. But we know that we have passed out of death into life because why? We love the brothers. So loving each other is actually evidence that we belong to God. My question is, do you love one another? If you find yourself hating, mad, angry, if you're always antagonizing, if you're always critical, if you're always cutting, if you're always wanting to get evil, if you've got resentment, if you want revenge, I would say, where, which heart do you have? Do you have a loving heart or a hating heart? A hating heart belongs to Cain that leads to murder, that leads to death. A loving heart lines up with Jesus Christ and it loves and targets all of those around you and that ultimately ends up in eternal life. So God's word is very clear. We have passed out of this present world and we've moved to the next. We've passed out of hate and we've moved to love. Some of you, ask yourself, are you hating or are you loving? Which one do you belong to? God's word says there has to be a transfer. But now we come to the second part. And to me, this is where it gets practical. So the first two points actually laid the foundation for the application of verses 16 through 18. The first one, as we mentioned, sacred love stands in striking contrast. So he pulls an Old Testament narrative out of Genesis chapter 4. So he says, this is what we should be commanded. Love one another, but don't be as Cain who hates. So those are the only choice you have today. Love or hate? Which one is your heart? Is your heart warm for, those, the, the, for God and for those around you? Or are you mad all the time? Are you hateful? You, 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 you have spite, you have revenge, you have that sense of animosity, that sense of coldness, that sense of ignoring, overlooking, indifferent to the other people. Because love doesn't look like indifference. Love doesn't look like I'll overlook you and I don't care about you or you're not on my radar, it's not that important. So you, you have to draw a line. Then the word of God says, if you do have a hating heart, it will lead to death. If you have a loving heart, it will lead to eternal life because it will give you evidence that you have Jesus Christ. Now we come to the third and the final point. 
And this is where sacred love actually gives sacrificially to those in need. And so we're going to draw two points in this. The first one is what I would call the life of Christ, which is the prime example of giving himself sacrificially in love toward us. And second will be our own life as a Christian. Well, we'll be able to examine whether or not our heart and our life matches that of Scripture. So let's pick up the life of Christ first. Now, we just seen the example of Cain. Hate it, evil of the evil one, slew his brother because his deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. So that jealousy and that competition and that comparison. Now, we get an example of Christ, which is not only a positive example compared to the negative example, but now it's also the perfect example. So what does Christ look like? Look what it says. We know love by this in verse 16. How? He laid down his what? His life for whom? Us. Notice that. We take it for granted because we sing, sometimes we sing old songs and we just sing the words and we just don't catch the meaning of the impact. We hear this Christ laid down his life for us and it doesn't move us anymore. It's like, oh, Christ died for us. Christ laid down his life for us. And we just go into the next thing. What's for dinner? And God's saying, stop for a moment and check this love out. This is the life of Christ. Number one, he loved that he laid down his life. So two aspects of his love. First, he did it willingly. In John chapter 10, verse 17 and 18, Jesus says, I laid down my life on my own initiative. My father did not make me do this. I pick up and I lay down my life on my own. So the love of Christ does it willingly. It's not coerced. It's not forced. It's not pushed. It's not, it's not crammed. It's not, um, I'm taken and, and you have to do it. He did it willingly. Do you have that type of love? Or you said, oh, pastor, you got to remind me to love my husband every week where I can love him. Or you have to remind me to love my wife every week because I might forget. Or you do it willingly. He did it on his own initiative. He did it because of who he is. And by the way, the same Jesus lives inside of us. So do you have this type of love? That voluntarily, second, and most critical, he does it sacrificially. What did he lay down? He laid down his life. And that life that he lays down, he gave his all. He held nothing back. And he's given us an example of, of how we should love. Do we love like this? Do we love taking, uh, uh, taking the initiative do, do we love voluntarily? Do we, we love willingly? And do we love sacrificially? Sometimes you say, Pastor, that's going to cost too much money. I don't think I'm going to do that. Or, you know my time is a little tight. I, I, I don't have any extra time to do what, you're, what God is calling me to do in this area. No, no you know what? My, I got my kids. I got my career. Maybe another season of life. Pray I'll be in this season one day. And then I'll be able to serve in the joy choir. But right now, I, I've got other things on my agenda. The word of God says to love sacrificially. But this word sacrificially sometimes is, is, is a little challenging because I think physically when we're born, there's the first principle of physical life. It's called self-preservation. Would you agree? Yeah, I'm only, my, my, my grandson's only two months, but I noticed this. He's all about his own food. He's not really up. I mean, he's like me. And, 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 and the older you get in the kids, and it becomes pretty evident that we're pretty selfish, are we not? But not just selfish, but we preserve ourself as a priority. That's a first law of physical life. In contrast, the first law of spiritual life is self-sacrifice. The first law of spiritual life is self-sacrifice. So what does this look like? One writer gave this analogy, so Danny, I'm going to use you as an example if you don't mind, okay? So Danny and I are taking a walk on a pier, and I said, Danny, you're my brother. We've been together for nine years now. We've, we've seen the birth of your, young, your, your youngest. We've been through all kinds of things, and, and he says, Pastor, I love you too. And I said, I love you. You're my brother and all that. He says, Pastor, I want to show my love for you. I said, okay, that sounds good. And then all of a sudden, he jumps into the, into the water off the pier, and he drowns. He says, Pastor, I just want to show how much I love you, so I'm going to jump in here, and I'm going to die for you. And he, do he does that. Now, how many of you would think that's probably the most idiotic thing you've ever done in your entire life? And Danny's much smarter than that. He's not going to do that. But now, would it be different if I accidentally slipped off this pier, and the current was strong, and I wasn't that strong of a swimmer, and Danny was, would it be radically different if he jumped in at the risk of his own life to save me? Would you see the difference there? God is saying, he's asking us to put the needs of other people ahead of our own. 
He's asking us to sacrificially lay everything out in order to put the needs, even at the risk of our own life. We can't even, like sometimes you're thinking, Pastor, 9.15 every Sunday, really? And, and we're asking you to love sacrificially, that it comes with a cost, that, that we're asking you to serve the body of Christ, we're asking you to, to do missions, we're asking you to bring the gospel, we're asking you to, to, to encourage those who are hurting, and yet it's like, that's too much. And yet the life of Christ clearly points out that this love is not only voluntarily, it's sacrificial as well. But now we come to the most, to me, the most convicting of all the, 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 the passages today because it's going to deal with us. What does our life look like? If do we have this sacred love, first of all, and is this sacred love in action? Remember the sacred love is God's holiness and God's love combined. You cannot separate the two. So look what this love looks like in the life of the Christian. First of all, he tells us as we start this love life and the sacred love in action, we must follow Christ's example. So in verse 16 it says, we know love by this, Christ laid down his life for us, not for himself, but for us, always thinking about the other, right? And then he says, we must follow his example. So we must all to lay down our life for the brothers. That word ought is very strong. It means that there is a, an obligation there. Uh, when, I was, um, when I came over from the West, um, when I used the word obligation or duty, I think for most of us in the West, it has kind of a negative connotation at times. Depends on the context. But like it says, we ought to, 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 to pay for our kids' college. Or we ought to take care of our family when they get old. So there's a sense of obligation. It doesn't mean we don't need to do it. It just means that sometimes there's a negativity attached. But when I've come here to the East, that word duty and honor is the highest joy. Like when they say, this is my duty, Pastor, they're smiling. It says when it's my, when it's my obligation, there's a sense of, of not only rightness, but there's a sense of, of joy as well. So when we say it is our duty to love one another, it's not a heavy weight. It's our joy. It's a duty. Because it was written more in the East than in the West in Scripture. So he's telling us this is what we ought to do. And that love, again, expresses how to put other people's needs ahead of your own. Now, as he calls us to do this, and this is where it's going to be challenging, and it's following Christ's example, I, I think one of the questions that emerges is this, is, how difficult it is to love people. How many of you have difficult people to love? Don't point at them, but how many of you have difficult people to love? How many of you need, like, some? I can share some with you. Uh, I, we have wealth, and I'm one of, I'm, I'm on somebody's list, I promise you that. So, but I love the challenge that he gives us that we ought to love one another, voluntarily and sacrificially. There's a Welsh pastor scholar by the name of Martin Lord Jones, many of you may have heard of him, but he calls, he calls a distinction or a difference between loving people and liking people. I want you to catch this. This was very convicting over the last couple of weeks for me because I have this, these categories in my mind. I don't know if you think in categories, but there are just some people that are very easy to, li to like and to love. And there's some people that are maybe a little bit more challenging, all right? And so he begins to, and I just want you to walk with me on this. He says, if we are commanded to love everyone, does that mean we have to like everyone? That was a question, by the way. What do you think? Are we commanded, if we're commanded to love everyone, which we are, we see that. We ought to love one another. And then it says it again, we love one another. Are we commanded to like one another? No, I'm, I don't know. We'll, we'll find out. Let's, let's maybe look at this together. Some of you are not convinced because I, I think some of us may look at the person next to us and say, I told you I don't have to like you. Okay, we're not going to go there. All right, so here we go. Because I think this is going to be very critical in this very simple command to follow Jesus' example. So the observation is, as Martin Lord Jones says, there are different personalities. Would you agree? We call it chemistry in our staff. Just some people get along better than others. It's not bad. It's not evil. Just some people you connect. When you go to a company or you go to a school or you go to a church, are there certain people you gravitate toward? You know, everybody likes chicken rice. They love me. You know, there's a certain gravitational pull, right? But, but, but we have connections. 
But there's also not only personalities, there's likes and dislikes and preferences. There's, there's all kinds of variables about tradition and ethnicities and backgrounds and all of those things. So there's quite a few variables. Then he says it is inevitable that we will like some people more than others. Would you agree with that? And there'll also be some people that we may not like as much as others. Would you agree with that? Now, I love what he says about this. By the way, no one like, not everyone likes you either. It's very humbling, right? So just simple word. But then he walks us through a little bit more. And this is where I think he gets even more convicting. Liking is a matter of preference. Loving is a matter of obedience to Christ and the word. I want you to hear that again, IBC. Liking each other is a matter of preference. Loving one another is a matter of obedience to Christ and to the word. And based on that, that we clearly see in these verses, this is what he, he ends up making the application. Love penetrates beyond the superficial and moves to the core of the person. So those things that you like or don't like about me, love goes beyond that. Love goes And and he cuts through to the core of who the person is. And then he writes, love overcomes all obstacles and excuses. Like if you're determined not to like me, then my love says I need to overcome those excuses and obstacles. If if I seem to be putting a a, a front up to you or a guard, love says I'm going to go through those excuses and through those obstacles and I'm going to love you for who you are. And then when it gets a little bit more, love sees beyond what you do not like in that person and sees that person the way Christ sees them. So everyone has to now have a different set of lenses, a different set of eyes. And this is the application. Because what do you do with the people you don't like? Obviously, those people you like, it's easy, Pastor. It's easy, no, no worries, no problems. But what do you do with the people you don't like? So the application is this. Loving people you do not like means treating them like you did like them. Loving someone you don't like means treating them like you do like them. How many times? I can say this for 50 more times if you want me to. Loving someone you do not like means treating them like How many of you are so glad you came today? (laughs) Now your husband has to act like he likes you. Isn't that exciting? Your wife has to act like she likes you. I mean, it's unbelievable. It changes everything. Chinese New Year is going to be radically different this year, is it not? This is where you move beyond the facade and the front, and you actually go to the core of the person and say, I'm going to love you like Christ loves you. I'm going to see you like Christ sees you. What a radical transformation, right? So we follow Christ's example. But then we move a little bit more. What are the key steps? And there's going to be three of them in verses 17 and 18. It says, whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother, one brother, in need, and closes his heart toward him, how does the love of God abide in him? My little children. Let not our love be in word or tongue, but let it be in deed and truth. So here are some pr- practical steps, and we're going to challenge you to take this home. So here it goes. First one, what do you do? Well, how do you move toward practically making this sacred love move into action? Number one, you must see the brother in need. Look what it says. Whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother. He moves from plural, love your brother, to singular. And I think there's a key important point that John is making. How many of you said, I love all of you? How many of us can say that? Choir, let's say, we love all of you. (laughs) To say, we love all, I mean, we can say it generally, like, we love my family. But then we start listing family members. Like, do you love this family member? Do you love this family member? Do you love this family member? We said, we love all of IBC. And then we can start, like, listing names. And it may be a different category, right? Or a hierarchy. So it's easy to love everybody. Sometimes it's just hard to love one. This is what he's saying. He says, not asking you to love generally and the general population. He's asking you to love specifically every single person one-on-one. That you see them. 
But you, it's just seeing, it's not just casually glancing at them, but you look at their hearts and you see their eyes and you see their needs and you say, you know what, I'm targeting. I'm zeroing in. I see that person's need. No matter what obstacles and excuses they push, they can throw culture at you. They said, Pastor, you're a loud American. I'm saying, no, I'm part of the Wu Dynasty. You, you say, Pastor, you're, you're, you're this way or this way. Or you, you may look at that personality and say, you know what? They're just weird, Pastor. Or, or they have this quirk. Or, or they have this understanding. Or they're so doctrinally unsound. You know, you just go on and on. We can have a whole long list of preferences. And God says this, see that person with the eyes of Christ. Move to the core of who that person is and love them. So first of all, see. Second, and by the way, I think that, that seeing the other person is so critical. Many of you recognize the name William Booth, who's the founder of the Salvation Army. It was been told that oftentimes he would send a one-word telegram to his officers to encourage them. And this is what he would say, one word, others. Always keep your eyes on others, not yourself. Salvation Army officers, others. Children of God, others. Always looking for loving one another. Always looking for the, their needs more important than your needs. Others, see them. Then the second step of moving sacred love to action is to be in position to meet the needs. It says, whoever has the world's goods, it seems like it's a little simple statement. And some of you say, oh, that must be the people who are rich. They need to help everybody. It's called redistribution of the wealth. All the rich need to help the poor, and that's it. And, and maybe that's absolutely true. But actually, this word doesn't target that. It says, whoever has the world's goods. And the world's goods is written in such a word that says, if you have enough to meet your daily needs, then if you see anybody in need. God is not asking for just rich people or people who have an abundance to reach those in need. But if you have just enough to live, then out of what you have to meet your daily needs, God says, if you see a brother in need, and the command says, and you close your heart, that word means slam your heart. It means cold. It means distance. It means ignore. Don't look. It means that it doesn't move you. It doesn't mean it doesn't stir you. There's no compassion. There's no mercy. And it says, closes your heart. And that word heart is a very unusual word in the, uh, in the, in, in the, in the Greek New Testament when it mentions his inner being. His, they were talking about his lungs, his intestines, his, his bowels, everything. So usually it was used in a way that says you're giving your very core of who you are with great passion and great um, emotion and, and, and great earnestness. And he says, you've closed that off to them. Then God throws the question, how can the love of God abide? So he argues from the lesser to the greater. If you have just daily needs met and you have just something and you see a brother in need, one brother, and you close your heart, you grow cold, you grow blind, you grow distant, you ignore, God says, if you can't even give something that you have in your hands to someone who needs, how, the argument to the greater, how can the love of God abide in you? Then we come to the last one. And this is where it gets down to the very specific. What a contrast. He says, my little children, in verse 18, let us not love in word or tongue. That means just using words, just uh, throwing words out there and just saying, you know, just these cliches. We're, you know, even if like, oh, we're praying for you. Oh, if you need anything, let us know. But by the way, I'm not going to give you my number. Okay? But let, just if you need anything, let me know. And we just give words and yet when they call and they need help, you know where to be found. And so God says, you, you have to do more than words. There's this wife that was reading this book. Many of you may have heard this. Men are from Mars and women are from some other planet. Venus, yes, yeah, right? So she's reading. So she comes home with this truth to her husband. And we'll see if you can resonate with this. So the wife tells her husband, I've been reading this book. And I just want to convey to you that I really, when I tell you my problems, when I share my heart and my burdens, I just really want you just to listen. Don't talk. Just be encouraging. Don't try to fix my problem. Don't try to analyze it. Don't try to come through all the solutions. Just, if you could just put your arms around me and just say it's all right. How many of you ladies just want to say, I'm so glad my husband's hearing that right now. 
Yeah, I see some elbows going. I see guys moving physically. But the next morning, he said, yeah, honey, I'll work on it. He loves his wife. He says, honey, I'm going to work on it. I really want to be supportive. I want to be encouraging. I'm not going to try to fix all your problems. So the next morning, as the wife was headed to work, she noticed as she walked outside that there was a flat on her tire. Okay, so there's a flat tire. And so she said, honey, there's a flat tire. He said, oh, and his heart was moved. <laughs> I mean, he really, he, he had compassion. So he went out and he walked around the car and he noticed the, 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 the depth of, the, of that flatness. He looked at it from different angles and he saw the tragedy of the flatness of that tire. And he, he was heartbroken. Almost tears came to his eyes. And he, he said, honey, I'm so sorry. I, I, I'm just, I feel so bad for you. And he put his arms around her with a strong hug. He says, honey, I just want you to know that everything's going to be okay. And then he left and went to work. <laughs> How many times when people really need something, do we just do that? God is telling us that if we're going to love not just in this, this word or tongue, we have so much noise going across the, the, the social network. Words, words, words. But sometimes they need presence. Sometimes they need action. Sometimes there's actually real needs that need to be met. And so what you do, you do it in deed and in truth. The word deed, we get our word in English, ergonomics. Some of you recognize that word. It's a study of the workplace and how it can be more efficient, productive, safety, all these kind of things. So we've applied this word. But what it means here, same kind of context, is you must love in such a way that's effective. That you must hit the needs that are really there. That you must really see the person for where there, there's gaping holes. And love says, I'm going to meet those needs right where they are. I'm going to be strategic about it. I'm going to be spiritual. I'm going to be sensitive. But it has to be productive. It has to be efficient. It has to be effective. And we're going to reach that. How many times have you received help that you didn't need? This is help that you need. Indeed and in truth. That word truth is in sincerity. That you do it with a, 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 an authenticity of the love of Christ flowing through you. In 1914, on the 29th of May, there was a, a boat by the name of Empress of Ireland that was sinking. And on that boat were 130 Salvation Army officers. 130. When the tragedy concluded and they did all the assessment, 109 of those Salvation Army officers drowned tragically as the story comes out as the survivors would begin to pass the stories along it seemed like there were not enough life belts for everybody and so what happened was that these salvation army officers all 109 that drowned had no life belt at all and what the survivors said is that they could see the Salvation Army officers taking off their belt and handing it to other people, even to much younger and stronger men. And they said these words, I can die better than you can. Perhaps the cry in that sinking ship of those officers as that ship was going down was the same word that William Booth sent out earlier. Others. 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 So many times we're self-absorbed. God says if we have the sacred love, it needs to be an action. If you're here this morning, you say, Pastor, I want that kind of love in my life. I want that kind of love in my life that not only will I hug my wife if there's a flat tire, I actually will fix it. I want the type of love that says I'm gonna, when I minister and I love, I love my family who's sometimes challenging and sometimes difficult, that that love will flow and that it will move their heart to the things of God. I want that kind of love that looks at others' needs before my own. I want that kind of love that can, I can take the initiative and not always wait for somebody to love me first before I respond. I want that love that says no matter what condition, whether they hate me or like me, whether they're ugly or pretty, whether they're fat or skinny, whatever, whatever nationality they are, I'm going to love them. I want that type of love. But you know what? If you do not have Jesus Christ, it is absolutely impossible. Maybe today you need Christ. Because you need the love. That love that says he willingly gave his life and laid down his life for others. For others. 
You cannot do that on your own. If you're here today and you do not have Christ, you cannot have this type of love. Now, for those who do have Christ, my question is this. Is that love that you have inside of you because of Jesus Christ, is it in a free flow? Or have you been hurt and you've shut down? You've been, you, 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 if you open up your needs, then you'll lose face. You'll lose your status, spiritual status. You'll lose your prestige. You'll lose your standing. you lose how people perceive you and how people look at you. Believer, if you have the love of God, there needs to be that free flow of loving one another. So I'm going to challenge you with this, and we'll send you off. I want you to find at least one difficult person in your life. You knew this was coming, right? I want you to find at least one difficult person in your life and say, you know what? I'm going to love them with the love of Christ. I'm going to love them like I'm going to take the initiative, voluntarily lay down his life. I'm going to, I'm going to love in such a way that it's going to cost me something. It may be cost my schedule, my time, my convenience, my comfort, my money, my resources, and I'm going to love them. And I'm going to look at that one person. I'm going to see that brother or see that sister. And I'm going to see what they need. They might need me just to help them with their children. They might need me to help them with their homework. They might need me just to give them an act of kindness, maybe a cup of coffee. They they might need just a a word of encouragement that I need to go and pray over them. They might need just something, something thoughtful, no matter what it is. I want you to target at least one person this week that may be difficult. And some of you say, Pastor, I have no difficult people in my life. So I'm gonna pray a special gift to you. (laughs) That God would just miraculously allow you to cross paths with somebody that you can share this amazing, matchless, immeasurable, abundant, infinite love of God with. How many of you are excited about that prayer already? But I think most of us will have at least one person that might be challenging. And so as we close in prayer today, if you are here and you do not have that love and you would like that love, the pastors are going to be here at the front, leaders, elders, their wives are going to be available as well. They're going to be available in the, in the tables in the back and, and in the welcome. But if you are here today and you're a believer, I'm going to challenge you to put your sacred love that God has deposited inside of you by the name of Jesus Christ into action. So we're just going to take just a couple moments before we get into the next movement to reflect and to ask God to just put an image in your heart and your mind of who that target may be. God's already given two or three to me, even this morning, saying, okay, I need to love like that. Is it natural? No. But we, we haven't been birthed naturally. We've been birthed supernaturally. Is it my resources? Absolutely not. Can't do it. No can lie. It has to be the action of a supernatural God inside of me and inside of you. So let's use this time to allow God to speak gently to our heart, to put that one person on your heart that the love of God, sacred love of God can move. Father, as we prepare our hearts over the next few moments, as we use this time of meditation, this time of reflection, this time of prayer, Father, that you would put a person's face, a person's name, on our target to love them. It may be a family member, maybe a, an associate at school or at work, maybe a boss, maybe an employee, maybe an acquaintance, or that person may come across our path this week. Whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and closes his heart, how can the love of God abide in him? Speak gently to your to your children now. Father, thank you for the clear word today. And let us hear the cry of William Booth as well as from Scripture, others, that we always put the others ahead of our own needs, that we would look for that one person this week with your eyes and with your love. Father, for the ones who have not yet received this love, Father, I pray they would not leave this place until they embrace and accept and invite the one who loves them 
that he gave his life for them. In Jesus' precious name we pray, amen. Obviously, go with God's love. Again, look with his eyes and love with his heart.